Okay, good morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a wonderful weekend and you're getting some good uh, spring weather. Start a little bit with uh, what's going on with the marketplace here. So this is showing you going uh, back to um, uh, 1919, so 100 years ago, what the S&P 500 um, average rate of return was, average uh, 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 rate of return over 10 years was. So you can see in 1929, the previous 10 years, the average was 13%. In the 50s, and 60s, it was um, the average rate of return is 15%. But down here, we see the average rate of return of 10 years is a negative 10. So that means what? During the, um, uh, during, right down here, that means what? That they average what? Negative 10% a year for 10 years. See in the 70s, it was negative 2.8%. Uh, 2009 to 2019, it was negative 5.1%. The average. So guys, if you'd retired in 2009, how would that have affected you if your average rate of return was negative every year for five years? Yeah, you'd be screwed. So you can see, are we at, uh, where are we right now? We should be looking for uh, greener pastures going forward or we're right at the top right now? So guys, are we at the top or are we at the bottom here? See, from down here, I know things could get, get better. So Kiplinger's had an article here in the last month, um, perfect storm for retirees. Today's retirees could face a perfect storm because they are living longer, spending more time in retirement while at the same time losing access to digital pension plans. This means they may have to make difficult financial planning strategies uh, than retirees in the past. So number one is low interest rates. Low interest rates is killing them because there is no safe haven except for what? So people that aren't working with you who don't understand FIAs, they are what? I mean, are the people that are working with you, how lucky are they that they're working with you? That you know a good place for their safe haven. Because the best place for the safe haven is what? FIAs. Why? So let's go back here once. Why are FIAs good? Even if we're, even if 2009, why were FIAs good? 2009 to 2019, why were FIAs good? Yeah, the zero percent, you can't lose money and you buy when it's market is low and you sell when the market is high automatically, right? So FIAs thrive on volatile markets. So number one, the problem is low interest rates. Number two is potential for inflation. Are we seeing potential for inflation right now? more than we've seen in how long. And then the market risk, and of course we're worried about our market risk because of sequence of return risk. So here's the Schiller PE we're at, says we should be looking at a negative 0.3% rate of return over the next 10 years. And this is our current, so this is, you understand that this is the, um, this is the um, 10 year average for PE, but where is the actual PE guys? So everybody write this down. Where is the, not the 10 year average, not the trailing 10 year average of the S&P, which is 37, where is the S&P right now? Yeah, 42%. When has it ever been higher? When has it ever been higher? Yeah, so this is something that we need to be uh, uh, concerned with. So th what is Kiplinger's idea for a solution? These many retirees in perfect storm, they need to make sure their savings last longer than any previous generation, but with interest rates is low, they may feel pressured to subject their savings to too much market risk. Do our clients have any problem with that? The most fundamental step to take is committing regularized frequent reviews to the financial advisors depending on portfolio size and complexity. This is often, most often quarterly, but should be no less frequent than every six months. This time investment keeps retirees attuned to the shift of the portfolio that will sustain them for decades to come. The nice thing is, if you're using an FIA portfolio along with the market, do you even have to get together with them quarterly or semi-annually? I mean, people used to ask me, Mike, uh, we want to work with you, but you're one guy. What happens if you, if you die? And what I'd say is, well, here's what happens. First of all, we set up your portfolio so that if I did die, it would last for a good five, six, seven years without having to make it a change. And I've got a network of guys that I can set you up with that can work with you that believe in the same things that I do. But my, uh, you know what? Do we want to fly by the seat of our pants or do we want to put in some good forethought, 
good uh, strategy that we know that regardless of what happens, because if, if we think we have to adjust every single quarter, every single six months, what does that tell you? That you have a good strategy or that you're trying to call the market? If you have to adjust every quarter, every six months, what are you doing here? Is it a, is it a good long-term strategy or are you trying to call the market? And folks, do you want to be calling the market in retirement? And guess what they all said? <laughs> because if you or I could call the market, would they be working with me as an advisor? Here's a good question. If I could call the market, would I be working with them as a client? If I could call the market, what would I be? I'd be on my private island in the Bahamas. <laughs> so, so we need to set up our portfolios so that even if I get run over by the proverbial bus, that you don't need to make any changes for years to come. It's not that we won't look at it. And is that how we set up our portfolio with a 50, 50, 40, 60, 60, 40? Is that how we set up our portfolio with FIAs in the market? Do they need to, should they be making any changes even on an annual basis? No, does that make sense? Uh, Inc. Magazine, why using logic alone to persuade others will fail most of the time. What research tells us about logic and emotions when it comes to art and science of persuading others? Well, guess what it tells us? Something that you and I already know, which is that studies have found that you need both logic and emotion, but not at the same time. In other words, you have to choose the best one for your situation. Other studies show that emotions are clearly more persuasive than logic. One study even showed that 90% of decisions are based on emotion, but then people use logic to back they just by their decisions. So here, we all know that, right? People make their, make their decisions based on emotion and then they validate that with logic. So here's the question. Is the 5Q system based on logic? Is the 21 point checklist based on logic? So I got a couple of answers. I want more people to answer this. Okay, most of you are saying no, and that's the correct answer. Because um, here's the thing. If I used logic, I would show them, and this is what I did. Was I, when I was making 50 grand a year, instead of a million a year, when I was making 50 grand a year, I was using logic. I was showing them that they were paying too much in taxes. They're paying too much in fees. They could be getting a higher rate of return. They could be taking less risk. That's logic, right? What does that get you if you show them they're paying too much in taxes, paying too much in fees, they're taking too much risk, they're not getting a high enough return, their titling is wrong, what does that get you? So Jeff, what does that get you when, when you prove all those things? Well, they're just gonna go back to their other guy and say, can you fix this? Yeah, uh, tell them the story about the, uh, how big was that B, the guy, the, the, the client with B shares? Wasn't it like, um, I can't remember how big yeah, it was, but it was you actually worked with that one. Yeah, it was a six or $700,000 account. But yeah, he, the, they were all B shares. And so the advisor went in and, and explained the problem with B shares and how he would have been better off in A shares. And that's exactly what the, the client did. They scheduled another meeting. And when he came back, the client was like, hey, I want to, before we get started, I want to thank you because I had no idea that was going on. And I went back there and reamed that guy a new one and he got all of those fixed. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> all good, thumbs up. Cause that was logic, right? Cause we logically think, well, gosh, if we show them how, how uh, we can do things better, they'll move to us. Guys, do people like uh, uh, hassle? Do people like hassle? No. Do they like confrontation? No. Moving to another advisor is full of confrontation and uh, um, <laughs> hassle. So if they can do the things that you're showing them are illogical and make them logical with their current advisor, they're gonna do it with him. So the 5Q system is not based on logic. What is it? We only use the logic to what? To tap into their emotions. And what is the emotion? What is the visceral emotion that we tap into? Anger, anger, why? What are they angry about? The bad advisor, the bad advisor's motive. That's right. Their guy is taking advantage of me. And you know what? Do they care if the guy gets paid? Do they care if the guy gets paid? No, they know we all get paid. What they're angry at is what? 
Every single thing that we walk through, they see that not only did it put the advisor in a better position, and they're okay if the decision puts the advisor in the better position as long as what? Are they okay with an advisor getting paid? Are they okay with the advisor being put in a better position? Yes, as long as what? They're put in a better position too. But what they find out, that's right, Nick. But what they find out is what? The advisor is put in a better position, but they're put into a what? Worse position. Is that forgivable? So, you know, in, in the last two years uh, that, that I was using the system in, in um, uh, practice, I had uh, two different clients leave their advisor who was their son. If I had used logic to get them to leave their son, would I have gotten them to leave their son both times? So one was with um, uh, oh, sh -sh 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 -sh. what Ellen Reed, and the other one was with uh, Thriven, which is now, or uh, which is Lutheran Brother, which is now Thriven. No, they had to what? They had to decide emotionally that, you know, I can't leave my money with my son. I cannot trust, I, I love him, but I can't trust him with my, my money. So the 5Q system is not based on logic. It's tapping into the fact that they can't trust their advisor anymore. And if they can't trust their advisor anymore, how many people will stay with their current advisor if they decide they can't trust their advisor anymore? None. And is that something that they can go back to their advisor and he can fix? No. See, here's the thing. If I know somebody is, uh, is screwing me and I run in and I, I see them in the grocery store, I'm a confrontational person. But still, if I see somebody in the grocery store who I know is screwing me, what do I want to do? Run up and scream at them or I just want to go the other way? I don't want to see them or go into a different aisle. I just want to go the other way. I never want to see that person again. And see, that's the, the beauty of the system is based on, on um, not on logic, but on emotion. And emotion can't be fixed. Make sense? So what, the main topic today is estate planning 2.0, the tech edition. So we got wills. We know all about wills. We know about powers of attorney. We know about advanced health care directives, trust, probate. But I want to talk about digital asset inventory and in the, uh, in the digital heirs. So what are some examples of digital assets? Well, there's email accounts, social media accounts, cloud storage. And guys, how many people have stuff in cloud storage, pictures and all that kind of stuff nowadays? Uh, uh, digital music, Word documents, spreadsheets, digital medical and images. And how many people have online portals or medical files? Cryptocurrency is uh, out there now, subscription accounts to Netflix, Hulu, all those things. Website get, get, gateways to financial assets, online banks, brokerages, etc. Apps, blogs, websites, digital calendars, contact lists, digital storefronts. So these are all, are these financial assets important? If somebody got in, could they destroy an estate pretty quickly with these things? Yes. So there's a law called the Revised Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act, or RUFADA for short. It gives internet uh, users control, respects privacy interests, and provides efficient uniform, uniformity. Because prior to RUFADA, uh, is, what would happen is that um, when you sign, or when you sign into a system, any of these systems, what's one of the things you have to check? You put a little check mark there. Whether you're doing um, cloud storage, or you're store storing it on digital photos, or your uh, uh, subscription, you always have to say that what? You've read the what? Terms and conditions. And guess what all the terms and conditions said? Guess who owned all that stuff when you do the terms and conditions? At your death, guess who they said the terms and conditions said it owned it? Yeah, it said they did. So this changed that, but not as much as you might think. Now, this is a uh, uh, revised uniform fiduciary access, which means that it's, it's, it's a, uh, not a federal, it's a recommended law. But if you look at it, most states have, all the ones in dark here, have um, authorized it. This is uh, in, uh, uh, I think that's, can't see here, Massachusetts. Yes, yeah, Massachusetts. They're voting on it this year. The only ones that have not okayed it so far is Puerto Rico, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and California. So most states have this. Now, you'd think that that would uh, um, 
fix everything, but we're going to walk through where it does not fix everything. So Rufida applies to agents of power of attorney. They're going to use this. Personal agreements or personal representative appointed by will or trust. The trustee, court appointed guardian, all of those people. The key points are is an executive or a power of attorney agent does not have the authority over the content of the electronic communication, such as email, unless the deceased person explicitly has consented to the disclosure. An executor may obtain access to digital assets, but they must petition the court and explain why the asset is needed to settle the state. Guys, how many, of, how many people's uh, executors or powers of attorney, agents of power of attorney, have the time to petition the court to explain why they need something to settle the assets? Does anybody want to do that? If an executor does not have explicit permission from the deceased, such as through a will, trust, or power of attorney, then custodians can use their terms and conditions to determine whether they wish to comply with the request, uh, request for access from the executor. See, and the custodians don't want to, if, they, if you have not explicitly said that you want the executor to be in charge of this digital information at your death, the custodians don't want to, to um, honor what the executor wants because they're afraid uh, uh, the custodians will not break the contractual agreement of their TOSA unless, uh, you know, the terms and conditions unless they have cover under Rufida. So what this means is that in the terms and conditions, yes, they say they own the data, but they also say they're gonna uh, broadcast your data to the, to the world or they're gonna uh, keep your data private. Which one do they say? Broadcast or private? They're gonna keep it private. So guess what they want? Do they wanna give some person who they don't even know who they are or says is their executor, even if they send them the power. Guys, how easy would it be to create a power of attorney? How easy would it be to create a will or a trust and send it to somebody if you wanted that, if you wanted that, uh, uh, to, to, to fake somebody out in today's world? Pretty darn easy, that's right. So custodians don't want to break the, the privacy agreements they have in the terms and conditions. So unless there is a something that's uh, in writing, it's going to be, uh, they're, they're for sure not going to honor it. Now, custodians have the right to request a court order and, all, and only must allow access to assets that are considered reasonably necessary for settling the state. So does it seem like Rufida has fixed a lot of things? Not really. I mean, it's made it more legal, but going through the legal process for this, you think it's going to be easy or not so easy? Complicated or easy? So the best way, and this is right out of um, uh, the Journal of Financial, uh, Financial Professionals, and it was written by an attorney, the best <laughs> thing you should do is don't rely on Rufida. What your client should do is they should have a letter of explanation saying, uh, basically a letter of explanation saying, all of my digital assets, I want my power of attorney, the agent for my power of attorney, or my executor or my trustee, if I have a trust, I want them to be in charge of my digital data. And you can list the accounts and then say, and all other digital data when I die. So you, you just want a letter of explanation. They need to sign it. I'd probably get it notarized. And then guess what you want to do? Just have a list of all the websites and the logons, usernames, and the passwords, and all of that information attached to the letter of explanation and then if, if your executors or agents of power of attorney, if they have all this information, will they ever have to even uh, call any of the entities? No. And are they following the law if, they're, if you haven't written a letter of explanation signed and notarized? The executors, the powers of attorney, agents of power of attorney, yes. So the best thing you can do for your clients is make sure they have a letter of explanation attached to their will, attached to the power of attorney with, uh, a, they might, obviously, they're not going to have a paper one of these, but they should tell them where it is on their computer because these things always are getting updated, et cetera, so that they can uh, um, utilize that. So why is this important? 
So yes, your representative can get access, but how long would it take if they have to go through the courts? How much frustration, how much time and money? And they need to have this information, why? To pay the bills, cancel accounts and reoccurring payments, protect personal accounts at Facebook, dating sites, blogs. Oops. So how important is it to have this letter of explanation and make sure your clients have some some way to have all their passwords and all of their um, usernames, et cetera, in one place. Important or not important? It's critical. And here's the question. Talk about, you know, talk about the, the, the shoeless cobbler's children or the pot calling the kettle black. Guys, guess where my usernames and my passwords are? All in one place, me personally, guess where they are? All in one place? Yeah, they're in, some of them are in my head. Some of them are in my um, work folder. Some of them are on my wife's computer. Some of them are, are handwritten in a clearing binder that my wife has. If my wife and I were to die, what kind of a hassle have we just created for our kids? So, am I probably better prepared or less prepared than the average client? Well, John brings up, uh, what about the survivor's guide? This would be a great thing to attach to the survivor's guide. Absolutely. So, I consider myself better prepared than the average client, but so is this something essential that you should make sure you talk to your clients about? in a newsletter, and a phone call, maybe even have an um, educational webinar for your clients with this. Also, is this some a conversation you could have when talking about the will with the 21-point checklist? So this is, this is not a tiny thing. I mean, guess where all of my money is? It's, uh, it's in online brokerages, it's at insurance companies, and it's at the local credit union. And guess how much trouble my kids would have dealing with all that? They could get at it. Legally, they'll get at it, but is it going to be time-consuming? Is it going to be frustrating? Is it going to cost money to hire people to help them? Yes. How much easier would it be if I had a one-stop shop, attach that one-stop shop reference to my power of attorney, to my survivor's guide, to my will, to my trust. Well, how, how much easier would it be for them? Does that make sense? Also, think about this. What if they didn't find one of my brokerage accounts? Because do some people on their brokerage accounts have paperless have paperless statements now? Yeah. So how would my kid even know that I had? See, I, I have uh, uh, three online brokerages because I don't want all my money with one brokerage in case their website goes down or blah, blah, blah. What if one of them, my, my kids didn't know one of them existed? Because I get paperless statements. So, but if I had that all, if they have all the accounts that I have listed, and that should be every single year they should go through and delete accounts that are no longer there, add accounts that weren't, aren't on the list, et cetera. So is this a value-added thing that would cost you nothing to bring to a client that would have a huge amount of uh, value? Heck, could you even find a, um, some sort of resource online that you could give all your clients? Some sort of resource, and, and are there any resources online? I didn't do any research on this, so maybe, Mr. Or, or Tricia, you could help with this and we could talk about it next week or we could email something. But a good online source for people to keep their, uh, all of their digital um, information like uh, the website, the company, the username, the, the passwords, etc. I don't know, I, I, I don't know if DocuBank would be a good source for that. I think it would be a, what I'm talking about is, yeah, you could, you'd have the, you'd have software that you could keep all that stuff and then you could import it maybe to DocuBank. But I'm thinking there's got to be, and Missy, do you know of anything like that where online there'd be a, and an easy way to people keep track of their passwords, et cetera? Yeah, I actually personally use one. It's called Safe in Cloud. Safe in Cloud, it's a password manager. And it can, um, 
you can have it sit on the cloud or you can have it actually like uh, just a encrypted file that is locally. Uh, it's a, an app that you can have on your mobile phone as well as a desktop and it works fabulous. My husband is an engineer, so I can tell you it was his idea. I was very reluctant with it for a long time because I thought it would just be a pain in my butt, but um, it's been super handy. So safe in cloud. And I think the Apple one app, you have to pay like five bucks for it. Um, but uh, I think on the Droid side, it's actually a free app for them. So. so the one that I have up right now. Yep, that's it. And guys, even if you said if it's five bucks a, 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 a year, would that be worth paying for your clients? And again, if you offered to pay five bucks a year for your clients to have this, guess what they would tell you? Forget about it. I'll, I, mean, I, can, I can afford five bucks. I'll do it myself. And here's the funny thing. Are there accounts that I know about that my, and how to get into that my wife that has no clue and vice versa? So if you bring this to your client's attention, you're going to have um, uh, the, those, the one spouse that doesn't know what the heck is going on is going to. Oh, and then um, Ray also says last pass. So let me take a look at that one. And that is last pass. We have, we have friends that use that as well. And I know a lot of people that use that too. So that's also another option. Thank you, Ray. So there's another good one. So good. So guys, is this something that uh, you should be talking to all your clients about? Yes. Is this something you could work into a 21 point checklist to provide value? Yes. In fact, could you give them this information at the 21 point checklist to provide value up front? Because remember, when we're meeting with a prospect, we got to catch 22. They don't want to work with you until they know they can trust you. And they're not going to trust you until they can work with you. So if you can give them free things up front, are you showing them that, that you're providing value before they uh, um, even become a client? Yeah, I think I've talked about this before. Is, that, is, there, is, anybody, is everybody or is, have some people not heard my, my home security story, my home security system story? So I'm shopping for a home security system, okay? And so I have three home security systems come in and they do their, their dog and pony show, right? So, so one comes in, totally professional, beautiful, uh, beautiful presentation, has a beautiful uh, um, um, lead behind material, et cetera. Next one comes in, same thing. The last one comes in, is disheveled, uh, but says, you know what? I'm sorry for being late. I was just uh, finishing up with another client. Here, before we even talk about this, can, let's, can we do a walk through your house? So we walk through the house and she's, she starts giving me these, um, uh, cause we had uh, what do you got, sash windows and she started giving me these little things. She goes, what you need to do is, is you need to, uh, attach these to your window. And they probably cost her 75 cents. She probably bought them in bulk. They probably cost her 30 cents. And she started giving me these things that I could uh, attach to the windows. So I, I thought that was brilliant. And how much did her, and guess who I went with? The beautiful presentations. She was, she had a good presentation too. Not nearly as beautiful, more to the fact, but why did I, I ended up going with her. Why did I go with her? Before I even became a client, what did she do? Gave me good, yeah, good free advice, Tom. She gave me value. So if we give ideas like this to a client at a 21 point checklist, we're already providing that. They're thinking, geez, I'm so good. Why didn't my guy talk to me about this? This is awesome. I'm leaving here with good information and we're only, how, how, guys, how many minutes are you into the presentation at this point? 10? Yeah. Does that make sense? Coolio. Well, thanks, Ray. Thanks, Missy, for those good ideas. So um, the, what's this called again? Safe in cloud or last pass. Thanks, Ray. Thank, thanks, Ray. Thanks, uh, Missy. So guys, that's all I had to cover today, but the, because I would rather you think about how can I implement this both with prospects and my clients as soon as possible. Hey, and also, you know what? I got to, I, I'm going to look at these two things for, uh, for myself as well. So uh, thanks again, Ray and uh, Missy. And Thank I'll you, guys. And I'll, I'll post yeah, go ahead, both please. of those along with the call as well. I'll post both of those um, website addresses. So for those of you that are interested, you can take a look at either Safe and Cloud or LastPass. I think both of them are great. Great fits. Awesome. You guys have a great rest of the week. Thanks, guys.
Thanks.